an astonishing announcement to make. Cyark has been in Los Angeles for 32 years, and Harry Cobb has never spoken here until tonight. Let me see if I can account for that egregious oversight. Or was it an oversight after all? Last weekend, I noticed two quotations prominently displayed on the walls of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. One announcing the El Greco exhibition, the other the Philip Guston show. Fortuitous though they are, these quotes are useful in explaining the case of the missing Cobb. Writing on the margins you're going to have to start listening now. <laughs> Writing on the margins of an obscure text in the middle of the 16th century, El Greco told us, the art which displays the most difficulties, the most difficulties, will be the most agreeable and consequently the most intellectual. And Philip Guston, the mid-century American artist from Los Angeles, and currently El Greco's partner at the Met, concurred as follows. All these troubles revolve around the irritable mutual dependence of life and art with their need and contempt for one another. Two similar depictions 400 years apart of art and conception in a fractious world. You've been told that the best architecture discovers problems, not solutions. That's the subversive model we all recognize. But revolution doesn't run in perpetuity although Cyark has long practiced a form of that existential romanticism. Harry Cobb does not. Isolation and fragmentation, the lexicon of synonyms that have long conferred the status of radical design, is the vocabulary stale, is the conception dated, is Harry Cobb the antonym to these synonyms? Harry Cobb is an international architect. He builds and has done so for many years. Harry Cobb is a teacher, and Harry Cobb is a writer and a juror. And by building and writing and teaching and juroring, he has become one of the preeminent progenitors of architectural opinion in America. But Harry Cobb is not a tragic hero. Perhaps Sayark was once Quixote to Cobb's Sancho, but current similarities now obviate the old differences. Here's Mr. Cobb's El Greco rewrite. The architecture which resolves, resolves the most difficulties will be the most agreeable and consequently the most intellectual. And here's Cobb's adjusted version of Philip Guston. All these architectural solutions revolve around an integrated conception, an integrated conception of architecture and life with their need to sustain and support one another. Harry Cobb is the antithesis to Cyark's thesis. Please welcome integration, synthesis, and resolution to Cyark. It's time to hear that voice. Thank you, Eric, for an introduction that indeed I did 
want to listen to. <laughs> and uh, certainly the most interesting that I can remember. <laughs> Thank you very much and good evening to you all. Uh, it's a particular privilege and pleasure for me to speak here at SciArc, a school I have long admired. This is not my first building, to, my first visit to this building. I was here a year and a half ago, and I was a number of times in the earlier, uh, in your earlier location, out near the water. Would have been much better for me if you'd been out, if you were still out there. <laughs> Took an hour and a half to get from <laughs> Santa Monica to here tonight. Uh, but uh, one thing, uh, among the many virtues of moving downtown, and I think it's wonderful to be downtown, but quite aside from that, uh, I'm very happy to be in this, uh, what shall I say, this delightfully attenuated horizontal skyscraper uh, that now houses your programs with such enviable verve. I, I really like this building. I hope you all enjoy living and working in it. Now, as it happens, I've chosen as my topic this evening your building's conceptual opposite, <clears throat> a building type always and everywhere controversial that is now the subject of particularly intense debate in the aftermath of the attack on the World Trade Center in New York. I mean, of course, the tall office building, a building type which uh, I was, I think I'm actually about a year late because I believe that you had a skyscraper studio last year. Uh, I think Wes Jones told me that. Was it last spring or last fall? I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm not sure if there are any skyscraper studios uh, going on now. Uh, but uh, I intend to consider uh, this building type not in functional or technical terms, but rather as a presence in the city. Or to state my concern more precisely, the skyscraper as citizen. I should explain, in case you may not be aware of it, that this building type has been a persistent and relentlessly demanding presence in my professional life. Indeed, there has been scarcely a day in the past half century when my colleagues and I have not been engaged in the design of one or more office towers. Added up, they total about 30 in all, of which more than two dozen have actually been built in an almost equally number, equal number of cities across North America and around the world. Now, I hasten to assure you that I don't intend to review all of these projects here. I mention the number only to make it clear that I cannot hope to approach this topic with the cool objectivity of a scholar or critic. Rather, my remarks must be understood as those of an interested, not to say implicated, party. And my attempts at self-criticism as the expression of a deeply felt ambivalence about a building type to which I have devoted perhaps too much of my life. This talk, in other words, will be somewhat autobiographical. Architecture, as Roland Barthes succinctly remarked, is always dream and function, expression of a utopia and instrument of convenience. This double meaning is indeed a profound attribute of our art, but its manifestation in office towers is especially vivid, it seems to me, owing to the paradoxical situation of tall buildings in the spatial fabric of the city. To understand this, we need only observe that while the tall office building inescapably intrudes itself as a dominant presence in the public realm, it is essentially a very private building, virtually inaccessible to the general public except at street level, and housing no public function that could begin to fulfill the expectations aroused by its assertive bulk and form. Thus, however effective the office tower may be as a beacon of corporate or entrepreneurial achievement, its programmatic limitations 
would seem to condemn it a priori to the status of a monument without meaning and a symbol without substance, an enormous and indigestible object that is inescapably banal, exploitative, alienating, inhumane. Now the effort to overcome this condition, to humanize the tall building and give it the demeanor of a good citizen has preoccupied American architects for a good deal more than a century and indeed preoccupies us still. Yet ironically, the underlying cause of the problem, that is to say the office tower's poverty of program, has actually proved useful in the search for remedies. For the mass of anonymous office space out of which a tall building is made, space that is isotropic, homogenous, repetitive, and conceptually limitless, such space constitutes a relatively neutral and quite malleable body that architects have been able to manipulate more or less at will, shaping it into an amazing variety of forms, clothing it in every conceivable stylistic garb, and conjuring up every imaginable utopian vision that might engender at least an illusion of higher aspiration in this quintessential instrument of convenience. Thus, the very vacuousness that has made the tall office building so problematic has actually invited and supported a great diversity of strategies for civilizing it. But to return to the theme of architecture's double meaning, the important point I want to make is that all of these diverse design strategies as applied to the office tower are virtually independent of the building's actual use. So that to a greater extent than in any other building type, dream and function are apt to be unrelated, each operating in its own realm, one public, the other private, and according to its own dictates. I would further argue that on account of this disjunction between the two levels of meaning, the office building, the tall office building, is inherently eclectic and destined always to serve as a clothes horse par excellence for the superimposed expression of cultural value. I suspect that I have by, that I have by now sufficiently tested your tolerance for unsupported generalities and I know that I've already exhausted my own. So I'll try to give some substance to this discussion by going now to cases drawn from my own work. With particular attention to one building, the John Hancock Tower in Boston, that occupies a kind of hinge point in my professional life. My purpose in thus focusing my talk is to render palpable something that I think is too often overlooked by theorists and even by historians. That is to say, a sense of how a work of architecture inevitably embodies the convergence of histories that define the moment of its conception. And in doing so, I want to persuade you that an, un that an understanding of such convergence is important not only to scholarly study of a city's past, but also to strategic thinking about its future. You will have noticed that I speak here of histories in the plural. I'm referring to the separate narratives that lead up to, intersect, and necessarily infect each other in the making of architecture. In the case of the Hancock Tower, these include the history of Boston, of the insurance company that was our client, of my firm, my own personal history, and even the history of the school where I received my training. While I cannot hope to delve very deeply into these histories, I do want to give you at least a glimpse of the converging strands that made the Hancock Tower what it is. To this end, I will begin by touching on my own student era at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. I am one of a rather small number of architects still practicing, or even living for that matter, who were trained under the teaching program established by Walter Gropius at Harvard from 1937 to 1952. Hence, I am the product of an ideologically driven pedagogy 
that through its mistreatment of history as much as through the methodology of its design studios profoundly shaped the practice of architecture, especially though not exclusively in North America during the decades immediately following World War II. In characterizing the handling of history at Harvard under Gropius as mistreatment, I don't mean to imply that the abuse of history in schools of architecture was at that time unprecedented or even unusual. As a matter of fact, throughout the three and a half centuries since formal professional training was first introduced in France, there has never been a time when history has not been in some way misused as an instrument for placing the practice of architecture in the service of a prevailing ideology. But unlike earlier pedagogies, which privileged one historical period or style over another, the pedagogy of the modern movement as practiced by Gropius sought to protect the student from contamination by all of history so as to clear the way for what was intended to be an entirely new architecture, liberated from the tyranny of dead styles in which art, technology, and social purpose would be powerfully joined for the benefit of humanity. This attitude toward history is elegantly summed up in one of Franz Kafka's most memorable aphorisms. The decisive moment in human history, he wrote, is a continuous one. Hence, those revolutionary movements that declare everything that came before them to be null and void are in the right, for nothing has happened. Now, the perfect architectural analog to this aphorism, an analog that cast a powerful spell on the imagination of my generation of students, was Le Corbusier's Plan Voisin of 1925, in which he proposed to eradicate the historic center of Paris, sparing only a few monuments, and replace it with an array of cruciform towers set in a vast green space. To understand the wide influence that this tabula rasa approach to city building had at mid-century, we need only notice this extraordinary proposal on the right by one of my own professors at Harvard, Martin Wagner. In response to a call for the best planning ideas for renewing Boston, he suggested, I believe the year was 1944, that the entire downtown be erased and replaced with a single building in the shape of a gigantic question mark. As if to ask, why renew it when you can just as well remove it? The image on the left shows the Boston of my childhood, a city that was full, self-satisfied, deeply resistant to change, a city wherein the Custom House Tower and the State House Dome remained as yet unchallenged on the skyline. As a student, I was wildly enthusiastic about Professor Wagner's proposal. It perfectly catered to my frustration and disgust with what I perceived to be the hopeless backwardness of my hometown. At the same time, it nourished my generation's hubristic confidence that we could, we should, and we would remake the world. My own Harvard thesis project, while more modest in scale, displayed an equal contempt for the historic fabric of Boston. Rather than work within that fabric, I chose to cast my proposal for urban housing as an aloof and autonomous cluster of towers rising out of the water adjacent to but disengaged from the city itself. By the time I submitted this project in the spring of 1949, I had already convinced myself that Boston was hopelessly moribund socially, economically, culturally, politically and that nothing of interest to me was likely to happen there in my lifetime. So I hurried off to New York to join I.M. Pei in his then fledgling practice under the auspices of the legendary developer William Zeckendorf. Ironically, the reward for my early infidelity has been a series of challenges that have obliged me to think deeply 
about my erstwhile hometown throughout most of the ensuing half century. Indeed, our firm has done more work in Boston than in any other city. However, the first office tower, indeed the first building of any kind for which I was personally and wholly responsible as an architect, was built not in Boston, but in Montreal. When completed in 1962, the Royal Bank of Canada Tower was the largest and tallest such building in Canada. Aside from its clearly derivative character, a body by Le Corbusier decked out in Messian drag, two remarks may be made about this early work. First, that it adheres strictly to the modernist conception of the tall building as an autonomous, self-referential organism shaped entirely by its own internal needs and systems. And second, this huge urban development project, embracing more than seven acres of land above Montreal's central railway station, was very much the kind of opportunity that I had left Boston in search of. That is to say, a building project of a scale that invited, indeed demanded, radical reordering of the spatial, volumetric, and circulatory systems of the city. It was, of course, gratifying to the ego of a young architect to have his very first building appear on a stamp, together with the Cathedral of Montreal. But in truth, the only aspect of this tower that I consider still worthy of interest is not the way it meets the sky, but the way it meets the ground. A levitational inversion of solid and void that prefigures my lifelong preoccupation with the question of how towers can be made to shape rather than merely preempt the space of the city. Even before the Montreal Tower was completed, I was called back to Boston in the winter of 1961 for the first of our many assignments there, the planning of Government Center. Although we designed none of its buildings, we were responsible for the urban design framework within which the various buildings were sited. We were thus responsible for reducing the number of streets within the 50-acre urban renewal area from 22 to 6, and we were responsible also for the size and shape, though not the detailed design, of the public plaza that has proved so deeply problematic and remains to this day a space still in search of its own identity. Whether this large-scale surgical intervention, no less ambitious in, in scope, uh, less ambitious in scope, but no less radical in concept than Martin Wagner's one, one Building Boston, was in fact necessary or justified is a question that I cannot take up here. But it is important for you to understand that owing to our involvement in Government Center, I had been thinking hard about Boston for more than five years before the Hancock Commission came our way. And in the process, I had discovered a city not after all so devoid of interest as I had once believed it to be. We come now to the skyscraper that will occupy the center of this talk. The floor plan of the John Hancock Tower exhibits for the most part a rigorous adherence to the discipline imposed by those characteristic internal systems, structural, mechanical, circulatory, operational, that largely determine the design of every tall office building. But we may observe the presence of one feature that seems to challenge the hegemony of internal systems namely the skewing of the end walls so as to produce a notched rhomboid rather than a rectangular plan form. While this deviation has been accomplished in a way that is coherent with systemic elements of the plan, it nonetheless cannot be explained by reference to any identifiable internal need. A yet more pronounced aberration occurs in the plans of the lower eight floors where one long side of the rhomboid has been rotated outward to form a trapezoid within which the structural grid is extended to a not entirely comfortable intersection with the enclosing walls. 
This peculiar plan form, so radically different from the undisturbed autonomy of the Cruciform Tower in Montreal, becomes explicable only when one turns finally to the site plan and sees the building in its urban setting. The rhomboid tower rising from its trapezoidal base is then immediately perceived as a response to the particular external situation of the building, most notably its adjacency to Copley Square and H.H. H. Richardson's Trinity Church. But just what was that situation? This, of course, is the question to which my answer engendered so much fear and loathing in the city of my birth. To help orient you during this discussion, a red arrow or a red dot appearing in this and subsequent images will indicate the site of the future Hancock Tower. I began with the observation, not in itself controversial, that while Copley Square and the monuments populating it clearly embodied the vision of an ideal city, the experiential reality at street level was something very different and very troubling. A public space desecrated by the rupturing of its enclosure and the intrusion of massive commercial buildings that seemed to render the space itself irrelevant and meaningless. In, indeed, so chaotic was the urban scene surrounding Copley Square that it appeared at first to defy rational analysis. By this time, however, I had at last come to appreciate the city as a living organism in a constant state of change, a dynamic process that can no more be understood by looking at a single image than can a game of football, for example. I therefore argued that the only way to understand what ought to be done now was to understand how Copley Square had reached this impasse to place it, so to speak, in the stream of history. Although that history, with the extraordinary topographical transformation it embodies, has its origins in the 17th century, its immediately relevant episodes date back to the 1830s, when two railroad lines were built to link Boston to its western hinterlands. These rail lines crossed in the middle of what was called the Back Bay, blocking its tidal flow and causing it to become stagnant. The health hazard thus created, combined with pressures for growth, led to the filling of the Back Bay, a vast project that provoked numerous proposals for laying out this newfound territory. With the single exception of the wonderfully imaginative plan on the left, which was unfashionably, unfashionably baroque in, in its inspiration and was immediately rejected, all these plans, while exhibiting a confident clarity in handling the area between what is now Boylston Street and the Charles River, uh, on the top of the image on the right, displayed, they displayed an equally marked ambivalence reflecting deep puzzlement about how to handle the area just to the south where the rail lines crossed. This ambivalence remained unresolved as the filling advanced, and consequently what was to become Copley Square was never really planned, but simply stumbled into shape, largely by accident, between the arms of the St. Andrew's Cross formed by the rail lines. The decisive moment in this story occurred in 1871, when Boston's leading Episcopal parish decided to build a new church on a trapezoidal lot in what its rector recalled was then a desert of dirt, dust, mud, and wind. Here we must pause to ask a question. Why, when they could have had their pick of any number of splendid corner lots, in the well-ordered blocks of the Back Bay, why did the vestrymen of Trinity Church decide to go way out in left field, so to speak, to the remoteness of the then non-existent Copley Square? 
The answer, explicitly stated in parish records, is that they wanted their new church to be surrounded by streets on all sides, so that as a freestanding edifice, it would proclaim Trinity's autonomy and by implication its primacy as the church in a burgeoning city that then saw itself not without reason as the Athens of America. In the pursuit of this goal, they invited designs from the country's leading architects, two of which you see here, competent if uninspired exercises in the then fashionable Gothic revival style. And then there was the scheme submitted by H.H. H. Richardson. Although his design was compositionally awkward and stylistically confused, Richardson won the competition hands down. He won because he alone among the invited competitors conceived and presented his project as a bold and absolutely unambiguous symbol of the aspirations, both ex explicit and implicit, that motivated his prospective clients' building enterprise. This is a lesson that all of us and all of us in the profession today are constantly engaged in competitions. We can all learn from this example, I think. When we consider this drawing, gawky and even absurd as it may appear to a critical eye, we cannot fail to marvel that an architect who was not yet entirely the master of his art, had nonetheless so thoroughly mastered the companion art of seduction. An art practiced here with such consummate skill that even the shape of the drawing, a roundel, emphasizes the strength of his conception while concealing its weaknesses, and by its cosmic connotations, subtly reinforces his claim to be, without question, the man for the job. Although Trinity Church as built is vastly superior to the design represented in Richardson's competition drawing, the strength and weaknesses of both are remarkably similar in kind. So much so that the official Richardson authorized photograph of the completed building, which you see here, shows it from the same point of view, albeit on the opposite side. Clearly, the architect's aim was to display to best advantage the powerful composition of apse and transept surmounted by a central tower, while concealing the unfinished west front, which the architect struggled with for more than a decade, but never resolved in a form that his client could afford. Unhappily and ironically, Trinity's disappointing west front, feebly embellished by towers and a porch after Richardson's death, was soon made to appear even more conspicuously wanting by its forced confrontation with the magisterial facade of the Boston Public Library built to the design of Charles Fallon McKim, who as Richardson assistant had himself drawn the Trinity competition plans. With Trinity Church, the Public Library, and the Museum of Fine Arts framing Copley Square, Bostonians entered into what would become a century long and indeed still ongoing debate about the character and purpose of the city's most important civic space. This debate, as evidenced in an amazing variety of unfulfilled dreams and unsatisfactory fulfillments, has been accomp accompanied by two opposing phenomena vividly illustrated in these images. On the left, the unceasing vigilance of Bostonians in protecting the integrity of the square from what they perceive to be inappropriate incursions. And on the right, the even more relentless pressures for change to which the square was rendered vulnerable by virtue of its peculiar topographical setting. In the perspective of history, it is clear that the outcome was never in doubt. Bostonians of artistic taste might rise in protest. And where else in Boston could such a headline have appeared? Certainly not in New York and probably not in LA. But their efforts must in the end prove fruitless against the onslaught of change that ironically was concentrated in the Copley Square District 
precisely because it was so firmly excluded from the residential enclave of the adjacent Back Bay. As Boston outgrew its historic downtown, the largest commercial space users, including the John Hancock Insurance Company, found that only in the vicinity of Copley Square could they acquire sites large enough to meet their needs. The coup de grace came in the early 1960s when the rail yards became an enormous mixed use development with a skyscraper as its centerpiece and the railway line became an expressway. After suffering those indignities, Copley Square, a distillation of memory extending cusp-like into the territory of invention, had been so desecrated that it had lost all credibility as a meaningful public space. To recover its meaning, or more accurately to find new meaning, the square so we believed must welcome rather than reject a dialogue with the new scale of urbanization that had engulfed it. We saw the Hancock Company's need for two million square feet of additional office space as the appropriate occasion to launch that dialogue with the aim of at last joining memory to invention for the benefit of both. Seizing this opportunity, we proposed that Copley Square should have its own tower. Our proposal was not well received. Indeed, the response in Boston was one of shock and horror. What we saw as the right building in the right place at the right time was seen by almost everyone else and above all by our fellow architects in Boston as the wrong building in the wrong place at the wrong time. But after nine months of acrimonious public debate, the necessary permits were obtained and in the fall of 1968, construction began. The one point I want to emphasize about this episode is that permission was granted not because I had succeeded in converting two people to my point of view, for I had not, but because had a building permit been denied, the Hancock Company would surely have carried out its threat to move its headquarters with its 12,000 employees to its eponymous skyscraper in Chicago. Now this brazen exercise of corporate arm twisting on the part of our client naturally contributed to the widespread opinion often explicitly conveyed to me in person that my colleagues and I had prostituted ourselves professionally in accepting and carrying out this commission. To compound the agony, during construction, the building endured a series of mishaps that caused us and our client to experience the rare privilege of being for almost half a decade simultaneously despised and ridiculed. The most notorious of these problems, publicized worldwide, was the failure of insulating glass units that necessitated removal and replacement of all 10,334 panels in the curtain wall. Mercifully, as you see on the right, an exuberant t-shirt artist didn't miss his opportunity to show us the lighter side of all that bad news. Although the deceptive mutability of its image may suggest otherwise, there is nothing mysterious about the design of the Hancock Tower. It perfectly illustrates my view that the architecture of a tall building is 99% logic and 1% art, but don't you dare take away that 1%. The extreme disparity in size between the tower and the church was, of course, the central predicament we faced. We chose to deal with it not by creating a gratuitous distance between the two. This would only have exacerbated the problem but by bringing them into close proximity while positioning and shaping the tower in such a way that it becomes the contingent satellite and the church becomes the autonomous center in the composition. To accomplish this, several aspects of the tower's design may be cited as essential. First, 
the attenuated rhomboid plan form placed diagonally on its site emphasizes the planar while minimizing the volumetric presence of the building so as to effectively disembody the tower as seen from the square. Second, a bull nose corner detail facilitates the transition from the trapezoidal base to the rhomboid tower. Third, notches bisecting the end walls accentuate the weightless verticality of these planes and make legible the tower's non-rectangular geometry. Fourth, the tower's uniformly gridded and reflective surface, stripped of all elements that could suggest a third dimension, mutes the obtrusiveness of its enormous bulk and defers in all respects to the rich sculptural qualities of its much smaller neighbor. Finally, the triangular space created between the church and the broad face of the tower pays homage to the apsidal view of Richardson's building, reinforcing its intended role as the architectural sinusure of Copley Square. With regard to this latter aspect, it should be noted that the three-story lobby at the base of the tower is sheathed in precisely the same manner as all other floors. Had the monumental scale of this space been directly exposed to view, it would surely have destroyed the delicate balance in the dialogue between church and tower. Five years after the building's completion, in my inaugural lecture as chairman of the Department of Architecture at Harvard, I summed up my view of the matter as follows. We adopted a strategy of minimalism in the design of the Hancock Tower, not for ideological reasons, but because the situation of the building demanded it. In the determined pursuit of our goal, to achieve a symbiosis between the church, the tower, and the square, we excluded everything that did not contribute directly to this end for we believed that only thus could we temper the inherent arrogance of so large a building and endow it with a presence that might animate rather than oppress the urban scene. Today, more than two decades after writing these words, I find that I can still subscribe to them, yet I also find myself still confronting a few questions that just won't go away. Can this city tolerate that intervention? Can this gesture of accommodation justify that act of transgression? Is this performance appropriate to that occasion? Is this tower worthy of that city? To each of these questions, the answer, it seems to me, must finally be both yes and no. This stubbornly lingering and quite disturbing ambiguity perhaps explains why, among all my built works, the Hancock Tower is as close as I have ever come to poetry. It is also as close as I have ever come to silence. And this observation invites yet one more question, touching on the always problematic relationship between architecture and power. One may ask, why is the building so silent? It's not because the public authorities wanted it. They would have been mystified by the notion. It's not because the architects of Boston wanted it. They were hell bent on preventing the tower from being built in any form. And it's certainly not because the Hancock Company wanted it so. They expected to get as forceful a statement of their corporate presence as $100 million could buy. This building is silent for only one reason, because I, its architect, wanted it so. Now, why should I draw your attention to this question and its answer? Only because it illustrates a profound, if too little, understood truth about the practice of architecture. Although architects are powerless 
indeed precisely because they are powerless. They must not fail to recognize and seize the residual power that occasionally accrues to them in the interstices between the competing power systems that invariably impinge on their work. In the Hancock case, the company chairman, whose entrepreneurial zeal was the singular source of this extraordinary building initiative, was thrilled by the opportunity he saw to use the two broad surfaces of the tower as a background on which to emblazon the famous Hancock signature across the skyline of Boston. You won't be surprised to hear that I did not think it appropriate to have that signature now recast as a corporate logo writ large on this building. Now in most such controversies, an architect's advice is simply ignored. For example, the crown of Library Tower right here in LA was until recently disfigured by the egregiously ugly illuminated logo of its major tenant, First Interstate Bank. For the past few years, following First Interstate's disappearance from the scene, the crown has been mercifully free of signage. Sadly, it is now about to be encumbered again over my strongly voiced protest by no less than four separate logos advertising the presence of another bank that has made this latest disfigurement a precondition of taking space in the building. But I suppose I must be grateful that no such intrusion has yet compromised the glass-peered loggia that distinguishes the way this tower meets the ground. In Boston, owing to the intensity of opposition engendered by the project, and the degree to which the Hancock Company depended on my willingness to take the heat, so to speak, in public debate, I was able to say no to the chairman and make it stick. He was, of course, frustrated and angry, but he understood that with respect to this matter, the shoe was on the other foot. The building did not become a billboard. So I got my silent tower. And this restraint to the point of muteness, the building's refusal to reveal anything other than its obsession with its context, is surely its greatest strength, but also its ultimate limitation as a work of architecture. Despite the forcefulness of its gesture, the Hancock Tower remains virtually speechless, and this resolute self-denial is in the end both its triumph and its tragedy. The opening of the Hancock Tower in the spring of 1976 now marks a center of chronological symmetry in my own professional life. 27 years prior to that event, I completed my studies and entered into practice. 27 years after that event, I stand before you now. While this observation is in itself trivial, it prompts me to draw your attention to a fact that is not so trivial. Just as the Hancock Tower was shaped by the intersection of histories that preceded it, which I've tried to outline for you, so it has in turn influenced every work of mine that followed it. Although this influence is by no means confined to buildings of the same type, it is perhaps most clearly evident in the office towers that somehow have continued to come my way and to occupy always too much of my professional life. Three examples will suffice to illustrate my point. Fountain Place Tower in Dallas, completed in 1986, utilizes the technique of folding to exploit the sectional possibilities of the double square diagonal that is the distinguishing feature of the Hancock Tower's plan. As these images show, an architecture of folding requires that the curtain wall be detailed in such a way as to confine all its visible elements to a surface of zero thickness. 
In this instance, the form thus produced presents dramatically varied profiles when seen from different points of view, creating the illusion as one moves around it that this huge monolith 60 stories high is itself in motion as if performing a dance. The diagram on the left shows how the tower's structural skeleton allows one half of its floor area to be cut away for a distance of 60 feet above the ground so that a densely forested water garden at its base can flow right through beneath it, an act of citizenship that animates the space of the city at street level just as the tower's profile animates its skyline. Tour EDF, completed last year in La Défense on the outskirts of Paris, exemplifies my ongoing effort, begun with the Hancock, to transmute the office tower from an autonomous into a contingent presence by deforming it in such a way as to make it responsive to the specific character of its urban context. In this case, the building's prow, located precisely on the skewed center line of the Grand Arche, is cut away so that the tower makes a gesture toward the historic monument in front of which it stands. At the base of this incision, a circular marquise, 20 meters in diameter, creates a gathering place where passers-by are invited to pause and enjoy the axial view of the Grand Arche from a sheltered vantage point beneath the generous canopy of stainless steel and glass. Thus, this entirely private building, it serves as the headquarters for Electricité de France and is essentially inaccessible to the public. It nonetheless becomes the occasion for shaping a memorable public space. Torre Espacio, is a 50-story building soon to rise in Madrid on a prominent site in the, at the northern end of the Paseo de la Castellana. Like the tower in Dallas, this building will present varied profiles when seen from different points of view. But in this case, owing to the slenderness of the tower and its curvature in both plan and section, its gesture is at once more vigorous and more graceful. Torre Espacio evolves from a square in plan at its base to a curved lozenge formed by the intersection of two quarter circles at its crown. The geometric mechanism for accomplishing this evolution in a constructible form is the cosine curve described in the diagram on the left, which as some of you may know from your own studies rationalizes the points of intersection between the two curved surfaces and thus facilitates fabrication and assembly of the curtain wall. The size and shape of each office floor, as shown in this array, is different from every other, a feature clearly unacceptable to most developers, but embraced with enthusiasm by our client in Madrid who declared it to be, quote, very Latin. <laughs> An important characteristic of the cosine curve is that its rate of curvature is not constant but rather decreases gradually as it rises from base to crown. This gives the resulting tower form its distinctive sense of lift, almost as if it were a living organism that had sprung from the earth on which it stands. And here, as always, I am as concerned with the way the tower meets the ground as with the way it meets the sky. All three of the buildings that we've just seen are descendants of the Hancock Tower in the sense that they would be unimaginable, or at least I would not have been able to imagine them had my sensibility not been profoundly reshaped by my encounter with the problem of Copley Square. And I hope I am not deluded in my belief that all three, like the Hancock Tower, fall within a definition of architecture once proposed by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Architecture, he wrote, is a gesture. And just as not every purposive movement of the human body is a gesture, so not every building designed for a purpose is architecture. 
Wittgenstein's observation is especially relevant in my view to the design of tall buildings. For is it not in the end the quality of its gesture that we most value when we speak of the skyscraper as citizen? Even though it lies outside the boundaries of my topic, I can't fail to mention here a project for the world's tallest man-made structure that Guy Nordenson and I did together last year and that he may have discussed in his recent lecture here at SciArc. The aspect of this project that I found most engaging was precisely the opportunity it offered to rethink the gesture of very tall structures. Until now, these have always been conceived as compact vertical shafts terminating in a single apex, even when sometimes rising from multiple bases, as in the Eiffel Tower, for example. Such structures are inherently autonomous, hierarchical, and self-referential. In proposing a new telecommunications and broadcast tower for New York City, Guy and I have shaped it in a way that sends a different signal, expressing interdependence rather than autonomy, equality rather than hierarchy, and openness rather than exclusivity. Seven stems, as we call our project, would rise from a small plaza occupying less than half an acre of ground just south of the New York Stock Exchange building in the heart of Lower Manhattan. The cylindrical stems, each 14 feet in diameter and 2,100 feet high, are set in a loosely ordered arrangement within a square measuring 140 feet on each side. You, those of you who are interested in numbers will notice that there are a lot of sevens in this project. <laughs> All but one of the stems tilts slightly in various directions within the underlying square, so that their relationships to one another change as they rise. At vertical intervals of 70 feet, outrigger beams connect the stems so as to form a variety of patterns, but without creating a closed figure at any one level. The structure thus conceived is essentially non-hierarchical. It sets in motion a conversation between equals wherein no one voice overrides any other, embodying a principle of civil discourse that we believe to be appropriate, indeed arguably necessary at this time and in that place. Finally, to bring this account full circle back to its point of origin, it would be impossible to overstate the influence of the Hancock episode in shaping my aspirations when in 1991, I was awarded the commission to design a new federal courthouse on a spectacular waterfront site facing downtown Boston. Here at last, in a city now so altered as to be scarcely recognizable as the city of my birth, I was invited to design a truly public building a building destined to be experienced not just externally as object, but internally as space, and a work of architecture that not only need not, but clearly must not remain speechless. You may not be surprised to learn that the task of making this huge courthouse sing its song proved even more challenging than that of making the skyscraper remain silent. But that, of course, is another story, which must be the subject of another talk at another time. Thank you very much.